it is all you. No, it's not all me, it's all Paul. So um, today, uh, and welcome everybody, uh, we have a Q&A session with uh, Paul Kirchner. And um, if you can just uh, move to, on to the next slide, my lovely assistant, uh, Matt. I just want to do like a quick debrief on, on what we've done so far, and then I'll briefly introduce Paul, although I don't think he needs a lot of uh, introduction. And then we can move straight into the Q&A. So uh, Matt, what we've done so far, and we've discussed this in our last live session as well, but just a brief overview because it has been a lot, right? What we've covered in the in the learning path, and I see Andrew uh, nodding, and and I agree because basically I think we've tried to discuss our whole profession like front to end and everything that we need to do when it comes to uh, the work that we do in, in organizations. We have talked about stakeholder management, which is something that goes across uh, across projects, programs, whatever. Uh, across the whole process, of course, is an ongoing uh, ongoing task. Uh, we've talked about how we identify the problem, how we identify root causes. Um, we have talked about um, all kinds of other performance gaps and the Gilbert uh, boxes to help uh, do this uh, analysis and get this view for yourself. And we've talked about task analysis and user research to get a better view on uh, what the actual work looks like in the context of the problem and what the users or the target audience uh, experiences day to day, what their job reality looks like and, and all that kind of uh, stuff. Overall program com complexity uh, and then how to design for complex learning. Now, why am I doing this debrief? Just because, um, Matt, if you can show the next slide. Um, you know, we the, the complexity in the title of this learning program is is over. It's all and what's the word encompassing? No, help me with this. All encompassing. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, the complexity is in the management. It's in the the politics. It's in the the the, the overall uh, design process. But I, I just wanted to like point out that today, let's really try to keep it focused on the learning design process and really on when we talk about complexity uh, around complex learning and uh, so that we can benefit as much from Paul's uh, expertise as possible. So let's focus our questions on um, like learning didactics um that type of questions and and let's try to avoid like politics and stakeholder management questions and logistics and you know all the other complexities uh just so that um yeah again we can just get the most value out of Paul today um so yeah if you can just move on uh Matt and then and then again uh, again, I don't think uh, Paul needs uh, a lot of introduction. Uh, Paul is my favorite uh, grumpy old man, and um, he's an emeritus professor in educational psychology, although the emeritus, I mean, yes, but I mean, I think, Paul, that you're as busy as ever, if not busier. Um, loads of publications and uh, almost 5,000 citations, and uh, I hope no, I got per, that around. Per, that's per year. Oh, well, a lot, as I said. Um, I just, I basically just want to stop talking and, and kick it off. Um, the floor is yours. So uh, we have some questions prepared as well, but I would prefer that, uh, that you all on the call will ask your questions. Originally, we put on an assignment, and I, I, I checked this morning, and I checked just now, like one minute before I got on the call. Andrew, I saw that you... Uh, did some work, so hopefully you have some questions. Ideally, we have questions, you know, that are concrete around the project, but just shoot uh, either in the chat or um, open up your mic, and uh, we'll see where this goes. It's 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 just open and unstructured, so off you go. Who wants to go first? Let's not all do it at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I can help. 
ask if you don't want to ask me, you can ask her. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and maybe she'll give you an answer. Yeah? This is mouse, one of my four four um, chihuahuas. Who always wants to sit on my lap. <laughs> I think and this this is probably gonna be a very basic question, but I just wanted to like open it up to this to who is talking? It, I don't see anyone. Sorry, this is the Andrew. Okay. Andrew. Andrew. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm so dark in here too. So the lighting's not awesome, so thank you. Um, but it's also four o'clock in the morning in uh, in uh, Hawaii. <laughs> That's true, but it's it's well worth it. Um, so I think the example that Miriam uses a lot is for complex skills is driving a car. And I think that's a really good example. It's actually really helped me to make it a little bit more concrete. Um, and the question I have is, you know, in breaking that down into constituent skills in order to build like what the ultimate complex skill is to driving a car. Um, you know, she, she broke it down so nicely in terms of being able to say, well, these are constituent skills like braking, you know, shifting, you know, looking, you know, watching out for all of their oncoming drivers. I'm, I'm right. probably not getting it all right. But how do you go about actually prioritizing them? Or is it is it something that you actually want to prioritize? Or is it the fact that you're really using them as building blocks? So maybe the priority isn't so important. It's more how it's coordinated together. Um. Nice question. Very, very good question. As a matter of fact, Andrew. Um, actually, you, we, I don't prioritize anything. The task prioritizes itself. Yeah, because there are certain things that have to be done at the same time. They're at the same level. There are other things that have to happen before the other thing happens. Yeah, um, a Dutch philosopher, his name was Johan Cruyff, said um, sometimes something has to happen before something happens. Yeah. So there are you, you can't have the car move unless you get it started. Yeah. So you can say, well, that has priority. Yeah. But things like um uh, uh uh shifting, yeah, that means the car is going in motion. That means there are other things you have to do at the exact same time. Yeah. And there are certain other things you have to do actually after you've done something. So the task itself often prioritizes the different um, subtasks for you. And that's why it's so important to actually, and I, I think you've discussed it, uh, do a, a good uh, task analysis, cognitive task analysis, because in that you can get to see which uh, um, tasks are um, uh, in, in hierarchical, and which ones are heterarchical? Okay, you have your cat, I have my dog. Woof, 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 woof. Um, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, if you do a good uh, task analysis, and it could be a cognitive task analysis, it, if, if, it's, 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 uh, if it's primarily something physical, it doesn't have to be a cognitive task analysis, but a task analysis in itself, then you'll um, uh, be a good step in the right direction of uh, prioritizing um, the different uh, subtasks within a complex task. Um, in uh, 10 Steps to Complex Learning, uh, which is going into actually shortly into its fourth um, uh, edition, um, up until now we've made use of now let's say two major uh, examples. One of the examples was uh, being able to do a literature search, and the other one was uh, being able to carry out a patent search. Okay, and if you look at that and you think of how do I prioritize things, it's very hard to start doing. I mean, people sometimes do it, but shouldn't start, you know, to, to do it without first deciding what your search question is. Yeah, that's something that you have to do beforehand, yeah? And then at a certain point, there are certain things you can do actually at the same time, or you can do either one or the other, yeah? So um, uh, it, 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 it also sort kind of like sorts itself out. Yeah? You try as little as possible to make um, uh, normative, subjective um, choices because 
they're usually not based on anything. And then you get into the problem with people saying from, well, why did you choose this instead of instead of that? And that's not the type of discussion that you want to have with, um, uh, what's the word, opdrachtgever again, uh, Miriam? Your clients. Your clients, <laughs> thank you. Yeah? Um, Andrew, just out of curiosity, were you asking this question um, from the perspective of, you know, how to have these stakeholder conversations and point out like where you really need to prioritize uh, when it comes to designing the solution or were you coming at it from a different perspective? Um, somewhat, yes. Yeah, I would say somewhat just in terms of being able to identify that to a client to say, okay, I'm hearing you say that you need to do this before this, for instance, like you need to be able to, you know, reverse and go back to your car. Like that's, that's important for how do you actually start your car? If we're using the car example, like, okay, so for, if I'm breaking down the task and looking at those constituent tasks, like then I need to know how to check my mirror, put it into reverse to, or to initiate the start. Like that's, those seem to be like very primary important tasks to identify. So I guess I'm looking at it for, for two reasons. One, to be able to identify what the priority is. And I think Paul's answer is really nicely in terms of like, okay, well, that's going to dictate itself without the normative judgment. But then in order to be able to communicate that to stakeholders to see that we're prioritizing the right skills in order to build that um, complex skill, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's important to realize that um, if the constituent skills are really interdependent, um, uh, it doesn't matter how small the constituent skills seems to be, it could be um, the key factor between uh, success and failure if you actually want to carry out the skill. And uh, what people tend to do is let's focus on the big things instead of saying let's focus on that which is key to achieving success. And it could be a very small thing, but that could be very instrumental in achieving your success. And that's very helpful. I also Thank think you. Just, just really uh, briefly, in my experience, when you do a task analysis like that, when you're able to kind of show the hierarchy, it, that really helps to also drive the conversations around why you need to design in a certain way to help people achieve what they need to achieve. Because then your stakeholders can clearly see, oh, this is actually something that will take a lot of time to develop. It's not something that you can just, you know, teach in two days or 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 whatever. So I think it's it's it just helps to drive these conversations as well. Yeah, this is all very, really helpful. Thank you so much. It's bringing a lot more clarity to it. Glad. Um, uh, maybe, maybe I should just pick someone. Huh? Cold calling. Shelly, do you have a question? I don't even see Shelly moving. Is oh, I thought maybe that was just her picture and she's, you know, like making a cup of coffee <laughs> yeah. or, you know, like, like, like my students do when I, when, when you're giving an online lesson and they just have this picture there of them and you think, oh, they're there. Um, okay. Well, so I'm going to be honest. I actually don't have a question prepared. I wish I had something brilliant that I could ask about. I was kind of hoping to come up with contributions in the flow of the conversation. So Sorry, I'm one of those cold callers that I guess uh, you know doesn't answer. I, I I will I will ask a question then, and then maybe the, things will flow from there. Because I think that we all know that it's 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 hard to drive this type of change in organizations, right? It's hard to even demonstrate that we are usually dealing with with complex skills, and then to convince people you know, how we should have designed for them so that in order for, for people to be able to, to learn and apply and, and support. So Paul, my question to you is, 
let's say you know our stakeholders are open to the change and they start to see like is there any anything that we can start with without going all the way and making it like a three year um program and i know it depends on what you need to learn but are there certain things that you would encourage us to focus on like this is if you have a bit of an opening then then definitely focus on yeah well um i think my answer to that would my experience with um stakeholders clients and that was primarily when i was designing learning materials for the open university is that um as soon as you start to talk to them um, they actually don't come with a question, but they already come with an answer. And what they think is necessary or what they want, you know, like sometimes actually it's an answer waiting for a question. If I wanted to say it very pejoratively, um, what people often forget, and that could be in anything from, uh, learning environments to curricula or whatever is to start with a good analysis of what you already have, um, what people can already do, um, determine um, where someone has to go and determine what now the distance is, what the, 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 the lacuna, I don't know what the word it is, the, the gap is between what already is and what is necessary because often that's not properly done especially by your 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 clients the, the, the stakeholders they have this idea well we're not selling goods so we have to do this and this and the first question you should be asking well not asking the first thing you should be doing is analyzing the situation um okay um if, if we're not selling enough what are those things that should be done in order to sell it enough? Is that a question of there should be more advertisements or is it the reps who are not doing their job or is this, that, and the other? And it's often very much packaged into, so we need, we're not selling enough, so we need a training for our reps so that they can sell it better. But that might not be the problem. So the most important thing at the beginning is is to, to to determine, of course, what the problem is, but to to determine um, where you are at that moment and what works and doesn't work at that moment, and where you want to go to. I can give you an answer, uh, an example from a um, Dutch curriculum situation. At the moment, they've been busy in the Netherlands since maybe 2012, 2013, to design new curricula uh, based upon a very social constructivist idea of uh, uh, everybody needs these soft skills and those types of things. And they've gone through two iterations and both of those iterations have ended up with crap. Um, I've been asked twice to come and testify for the uh, let's call it the House Committee on Education. Okay? And each time they've asked me, what should they do? What should we do with this report or based upon this report? And my answer was throw it into the circular file because it's worthless. Because both of the times they started from the idea of we need a curriculum, new curriculum, and it should be this. Instead of saying, we already have a curriculum. We want our students at the end of their study to be able to do that. What is it that works and what is it that doesn't work? And let's leave those things that work in place. And let's see what we then need to do to get those other things. And they're constantly going for the big picture, doing something completely new, setting it up from scratch, throwing out you know, the baby with the bathwater. And they'll be in the exact same situation as they are now because they'll end up with something that people don't want, people don't need. People, I mean, I learned when I was designing environments that the worst thing that you could ever do is explain to someone 
why they need what you're making. If it's not completely evident to them from the beginning that it makes their job more effective or efficient or more enjoyable, and you have to explain to them how it will help them. We saw that with the introduction of um, content management systems and learner systems in online learning. We heard from Blackboard that this will make your life easier as a teacher and it solves this and this problem. And all of the instructors that I knew said, but I don't have that problem. So the first thing is, what's the problem? What's the discrepancy? What do we already have? What skills and what knowledge do they have? And what at the end do they need to do? And maybe the discrepancy is very, very small and you don't need a three-year project, but a three-month project might be just enough to do it if you've looked at your starting situation, your end goals, and what you need to get there. Yeah, it sounds really easy, but I... It is, it it is really easy. It's just, it's very... Um, um, that philosopher that I was talking about, Johan Cruyff, said um, uh, 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 football is a very simple game. The hardest part is keeping it simple. Yeah? yeah? And that's that's just it. People don't realize how... Good, Johan Krauf. Well, yeah, Don! Don has a question. Okay, Don. Oh, I have about a million questions, but I do a lot of, like, university curriculum development. All okay. Right? So you're taking the tasks yeah. and you're breaking, sometimes the the knowledge pieces, the supporting information crosses multiple tasks. Yeah. So it makes sense to separate it out. So I have kind of two related questions that are kind of open for discussion. One is, um, are there some things that we should be thinking about, about efficiency when we have to present, you know, a lot of supporting information or content knowledge, domain knowledge that people need to, to perform a task? And then the second thing is, you know, there's enormous pressure to break things into smaller and smaller pieces and separate them by time. Yeah. Uh, I notice that learners then have trouble putting the pieces back together. So oh, yeah. based on how we, we organize these um, more complex uh, knowledge structures, because we do have to work more in the future to help people build capacity um, what are some things that we need to be thinking about for that organization in terms of, um, you know, scaffolding it in an efficient way so that we're not reteaching information task by task, as well as um, separating things over time, because that's the reality of the world we live in. Does that question even make sense to people? Yes, it, make, it makes sense to me. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah, it makes sense <laughs> to me. I, I, I think. If just that, I'm happy. Okay. One of one of the major problems with higher education, which actually most education, is that it's highly compartmentalized. Huh? If people ask me, can you use 4CID or the 10 steps in a high school? I usually say no. Don't even don't even attempt it. And the reason I say don't even attempt it is because you have a course in biology and in physics and in math and in history and things like that. And there's knowledge that people want you to have acquired at the end and possibly skills that they want you to have acquired at the end. But there's no task at the end of biology that sums up what you need to know in biology. Yeah. So the first thing is, um, can you set it up in a way in which for example, in higher education, in which at the end of this course in microbiology, you can, you're able to set up a research project on microbiology, okay? If you do that, then you're contextualizing constantly what you're doing. You're not fragmenting and compartmentalizing because you're working on it in a way in which all of the this different constituent skills and the knowledge that lies underneath it are necessary within that context. 
it gives you the chance to constantly, if you do it in the way of 10 steps to complex learning or four CID, to constantly increase the complexity of the mm -hmm. task in which gives you a reason to add the new information just in time when it's needed because the task has become more complex. The substrate is uh, uh, no longer a gel, but a cell or whatever, that type of thing. Yeah, which means you need new knowledge and new skills which are incorporated into it. And it gives you the possibility, if, if we look at desirable difficulties, um, uh, what we see in that is that if you want people to be able to use knowledge in different situations, you have to have them make use of it mm -hmm. in different types of tasks. It, it allows them to discriminate between um, two things that look the same, but at a higher level of abstraction are very different. Or you could say it at, a, at, at underneath the surface, they're completely different. And it also teaches you to look at things that are very different, but possibly in the underlying conceptual basis are very, very similar. And you can only do that by varying the tasks and adding to complexity mm -hmm. to the tasks and have them do it not only different tasks that are related to each other either at the same level of 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 of, of concept mm -hmm. or different but also in different situations because they 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 they're not always the same if 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 i want to teach someone to um replace a jet engine yeah um, I have no idea where that person will be, and there are quite a lot of decisions that she or he will have to make, which means it's not only that the tasks need to differ, that it's now the 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 carburetor instead of uh, the, the spark or whatever, but also doing it in the desert in a war situation or doing it in a hangar in which it doesn't make a difference. So you have to also, the, Bjork and Bjork called that, uh, uh, contextual variability. So you have yeah. task variability and contextual variability. And if you make use of those two things, all of a sudden that disconnect that your students are experiencing because it's delivered in different time. It's not in a just-in-time way. Right. As right. Um, John Sweller would say, uh, you have, um, you need temporal con contiguity, you need to have it at the moment that you need it, and then repeat it at a, a, a later moment. What we often has, have is this, we give a lot of extra knowledge, let's call that, or information to students, because we think that they will eventually need it. But at the time that they need it, the the, the 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 temporal gap between when they learned it and when they used it first and when they actually need it is very very large and my experience with um content area experts is they tend to look at what you all of the knowledge that you need instead of what is the knowledge you need at this moment they're afraid if you don't give it all that they'll miss some of it and you need to look at in 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 more of a yes. just in time fashion with contextual contiguity that it's used in the context that it's needed and temporal contiguity that it's that it's given or taught or learned or whatever word you want to use at the moment that it's needed and then in varying contexts with varying tasks and, so uh, I'm yeah. sorry. I was oh, going to no, say no, no, so no. so in a curriculum when you have things separated by courses and say we we've chosen an accomplishment of value that's consistent maybe with an occupational uh task. Yeah. So so we're going to teach them how to set up a research project. Right. But there's a fair amount of math that they have to have and based on the way curricula are typically designed that math would happen in a different class maybe taken in a different semester, hopefully before they need it, but sometimes after, we know how that goes. 
Um, so I'm talking about that level of separation. Right. I'm, I'm completely agree okay. with you. And that's really okay. hard. That's really, really hard because that requires a complete rethinking of your curriculum. Um, if you say we're, we're, we're at the higher education level and at the end we want to have an engine, a civil engineer or a lawyer or whatever, mm -hmm. that's the level you have to start and not at what are all of the courses that we need Yes. So that at the end, hopefully you'll all you'll be able to tie it all together. Um, we're working from a situation in which it's completely normal to compartmentalize and fragment the knowledge that's necessary with the idea at the end, with that final project, we'll all draw it, we'll draw it all together. Right. Whereas it requires a rethinking, it's they'll, they'll all get their 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 knowledge in all of those different teachers that's no problem that'll come that if, if it's necessary to have that knowledge to be a good lawyer or, or be a good civil engineer it'll all be in there but the idea is it might not be in there in that course that you're now at this moment used to and why not spend four years in a spiral curriculum in which you're constantly um, increasing the complexity of a task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, from a higher level, this is this is my. I, I love you, Dawn, for this question. Um, oh. uh, I made. I I I designed a course on um, uh, food and toxicology. Yeah, and um, and this was at the the graduate level, uh, university and graduate level, in the Open University. And the way we set it up is we first gave them around the task of how do you solve this toxicological problem from a scientific point of view and all of the different scientific techniques that you can do to combat bacteria and viruses and whatever in food that could make you sick from it for botulism and whatever they were discussed and they, the students came with an answer to that. And then we expanded that the context of it and we said from OK, but from an engineering point of view, you have certain things that are possible, certain things that are possible at high costs, and certain things that are at this point in time not really possible. Yeah. And we yeah. gave them the exact same question. But now they had to add their to their scientific knowledge, the technological knowledge of whether it can be done or not. And you figure, okay, that's great. So now certain things that would have worked from a scientific point of view are not doable at a technological point of view. And then our next step in this course, and we could have gone on and on and on and on, but our next step was the psychological aspects of it. And you can say psychological. Yeah, because if, mm -hmm. let's say, you just say you have shrimp. And shrimp, you can have them you can get rid of all the bacteria in a number of different ways including cooking them and sterilizing them but they don't taste very well they get chewy and things like that yeah but if you irradiate them yeah you solve the problem but if people think irradiation i if i close my 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 um uh, refrigerator door there'll still be light in my refrigerator because they don't know the difference between radiation and irradiation. So the psychological mm -hmm. aspect, right. you can't put it in your supermarket and say, these are irradiated shrimp because nobody will buy them. What we've done is the task of, of this person was to be able to deal with all of those things. And we constantly made the task more complex by adding another layer of things that had to be thought about if you want to do it. But it was no longer based upon this is the knowledge and this and this and this, but it's more, okay, how do we deal with this task of making this food um, uh, longer how to buy? Um, Desirable? Thing. Marketable? Oh, longer um, longer uh, lasting. Yeah. Increase yeah. the shelf life. Yes. Yeah, yeah. How, increase the shelf life. Without making it can into I, a can I just can I just so so assuming that that Don is not able to redesign the whole curriculum that way, 
is there some kind of intermediate phase possible for example create like working with the different courses and creating some kind of narrative it i don't could know be, but it depends upon you can't say it generally you can't say um some courses some domains might lend themselves more mm -hmm. to um saying what should someone be able to do what is the task that she or he should be able to do at the end of this course and then that's that, that's easy yeah because what you do is then you see that that course as a microcosm of the curriculum and you can do it in the same way but there might be other domains or courses in which it's more difficult if not impossible to do and i don't know if they exist if you ask the teacher the instructor her or his answer will probably be yes it's impossible because they don't want to change but you have to take a long hard look and say ask them don't give me the questions on your final exam. What should some, someone be able to do at the end of your course? Yeah, And if that's in a course on calculus, be able to, to calculate the um, surface area of a donut or a, or, or a crawler, then you've reached the point that you need to be, if that's what it is. Because in doing that, you then learn uh, partial derivatives and you learn limits and all of those types of things but in the context and so then you begin with a task where you finally at the end you're then determining the surface area of a, a Krispy Kreme's donut. So can we talk about it in the context you know I, I brought it in a university setting I do some of my work there but also in business and industry where you've got jobs that a huge percentage of the underlying knowledge and skills are changing. Yeah. So um, are there any specific considerations there? I mean, in university, yeah. yes. Yes. we're yes. prepared to teach people new things. But sometimes in business and industry, they're like, oh, they already know how to do all these things. And you're like, yeah, they really don't. I don't, I don't agree with you because what okay. I see in universities and uh, other academic institutions, we teach science as if it's uh, a, a bunch of, of, of facts, right? Which, which it isn't. What you need to do is to, be a, is to put people in uncertain situations so that the, they themselves realize that the knowledge that they have isn't sufficient. An example that I use, I did, I, I did um, a, a, a project. I was part of the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Studies. Yeah, you also have one in Princeton. I'm not going to say we're anything like it, but I was chosen as a fellow there, and I did a piece of research on how do you train students for not yet existing jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was the thing. Okay, and one, of the, one of the important things in that was a good knowledge base. But the other thing is to have them achieve, help them achieve the mindset that the knowledge that they have at this moment isn't even enough to solve the problems of this moment, let alone in the future. And I gave an example of that when I was talking uh, at, at a conference. And I said, let's say we have a, a vocation and that's being a baker or a cook, okay? Um, what we normally do is we test our students in certain situa situations and we say, okay, you have to break a ye bake a yeast bread and you have to bake a sourdough bread and you have to bake an eclair or whatever, you know, those types of, of things, yeah? And we check out whether or not they can do it, whether they can follow the recipe, whether they can find the recipe and stuff like that. That's our normal way of doing it. What I said is, don't do it in the normal way, but also say to them, ask them questions like, if you were in Crested Butte, Colorado, could you bake a bread or cook your spaghetti in the same way? Would you do it in the same way? And they'd look at you and they say, huh, what? I said, well, look up Crested Butte. Okay, that's, that's 10,000 feet. 
if you're cooking, water boils at 10,000 feet at like 88 degrees or what is it, 180, 190 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 212, which means your spaghetti will not get done, which means your eggs will not be hard boiled in seven minutes. That means that your bread, because of the air pressure, will rise differently. Create situations in which the student needs to be insecure about her or his knowledge at this moment that they've gained, because they have the idea if they graduate that they know how to bake. But if they get a job in Switzerland or in Crested Butte, Colorado, and they go there, all of their baking and their cooking will end up flat, literally. Okay? Now, if you can create that mindset in people at this moment, then their minds are open for, and what do I need for the future? Then they know that they don't know it all. Then the future doesn't become this scary thing but it's only an extension of the present in which the knowledge that they have working. And I mean, in, in a business situation, that's also great because what works in the United States won't work in the Netherlands, definitely won't work in Belgium, won't work in, in Japan because of the social differences. So they have to learn that that which they know doesn't mean and, and works now and here won't work in other places in 2022, let alone in 2030. And that's the mindset. Some people have the idea, I know it, I can do it, I've learned it, and the future is scary because of things I don't know of. While we should be dealing with people in a way that their mindset at this moment is, I don't know it. I've been taught to do it in a certain situation with certain things at a certain place in a certain time and to do it in other ways i also have to get new knowledge what are the customs in japan what does it mean when someone says that sounds like a good that's a good idea in england that means like oh you're crazy whereas an american thinks oh he thinks my idea is good yeah let's think about it no let's think about it means i don't want to do anything with it those types of things are things that are happening right now. That's the mindset you need to help the uh, people taking your courses achieve. And then their mind is open to gaining new knowledge and they're not scared of the future, but they're ready to deal with it. Thank you. You're quite all right, Dawn. What great questions. Any other questions? Oh, by the way, I have to say, I don't know if it, I uh, will... And it's now 44 minutes after whatever hour you people have somewhere in the world. I will be leaving at 58, between 58 and 59, because at exactly yeah. 60, I have another meeting. I keep an eye on the clock. So, so Don, you also asked a question about, I don't know if you still want to discuss that, you know, like the trend is, and I recognize this as well, it's probably both in universities and in corporates and other organizations. Yeah, breaking things down. Breaking things down in like bite size because people don't have long attention spans, people don't have time. That's those are the arguments, right? And and Don, you were already saying that that is creating a fragmented uh, design approach as well. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about how we can deal with that. Now, the best way to deal with that is to be able to use it in context. Um, uh, what you want people to be able to do is place it within a schema, within the long-term memory. And that schema is not only composed of uh, uh, loose facts, but based upon contexts and situations. And so uh, the problem is people are given the fragmented information and are not helped to understand where and when and how it can be used. And they're expected a certain amount of point in time to be able to do that. And, you know, like 
just think of it logically. If we took the seat off of a bicycle and taught you to balance on that seat and we gave you wheels and taught you how to pedal something and we gave you a handlebar and taught you how to turn it to the left and the right and said, okay, you've learned all of the basics of riding a bicycle. Here's a bicycle, go ride it. It just won't happen. So, Paul, are you saying that this is this whole trend is just not acceptable? And we it's just not acceptable. If you want people to yeah. learn in an effective way, in an efficient way, it's not the way to do it. Mm. Because at the end, they have a mass of um, often, if at best, they have a mass of um, unconnected knowledge. Yeah that don't understand. Um, I, I'll give you an example. I, I had a discussion with someone years and years ago about uh, uh, mass and weight. And it was just, couldn't be understood. But if you look at it in terms of, if I'm on the moon, I don't have a smaller mass but because of gravity. And they learned about a gravitational constant, yeah? That determines my weight, and and on at, on the Earth the gravitational constant is one, and that means sixty six kilos of mass is sixty six kilos of weight. But because the gravitational constant on the Moon is one sixth of the Earth, it's your mass is still sixty six, but your your weight is your mass is still sixty six, but your weight is eleven kilos. Yeah, because no one taught them in any connected way about the relationship between mass, weight, and gravity. They all knew what the gravitational constants were. They knew what the mass of something was and could use that in a, in a formula and knew about weight, but couldn't understand why you weighed less on the moon. Now, that's the difference between each of those things were taught in an unconnected way, whereas if you teach it in a way in which mass, weight, and gravity, and it, it's a, just a very simple, you know, childlike uh, situation, which we get in maybe the first year of, 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 of high school or secondary school. But the fact is that it was taught in that compartmentalized way that means that a lot of people have actually no idea what the difference is between mass and weight and why that is the case. And for certain things, that's really important to know the difference between them. Sorry about that. That's my wife's telephone. She's going to walk the dog now, and it's probably my daughter. Yeah, that's my daughter who just called. I can tell it on the voice. She's now going to walk with the dogs. And I'm alone with you people for the next... 11 minutes. Max. Okay. Paul, how do you, in medical schools, yeah. we often complain quite a bit about how medical students are, are just given tons of texts. They have to memorize lots of things. Um, they're certainly not interactively learning uh, except on their own possibly. Yet most doctors tend to become good doctors. Okay. How do we reconcile Oh, easy. Some of that, and maybe um, maybe it's an assumption that they become good doctors. No, it's a that's it, that's an assumption, and I hope that that's the case. Otherwise, there might be more malpractice suits than what we actually have, and more people dying than we need. Well, at this moment, with the overpopulation, we might want to have more people <clears throat> dying, but that's a that's an ethical question. We won't go into that. We'll discuss <laughs> that at dinner, Matt, in December. Excellent. Um, <laughs> um, what we have to realize about the medical. I mean, I can only talk about the mm -hmm. Netherlands, yeah, um, about, but I think it's the same in the United States. You have a couple of years of medical school in, less, where, where, in which you get all of this disconnected knowledge. Yeah? Right. But we then go over in the Netherlands, you have certain internships and specializations. Yeah. And we see at that point in time, they're under constant coaching. I mean, take a look at, at um, a house MD, um, what, what you know the the television program and how um uh house 
um, worked with his, I always find that a great television program because you see two things. One, the way he dealed with all, dealt with all of the unconnected knowledge and had constantly was asking the people within his group who were all interns, yeah, wanting to become pathologists or or whatever, how he, he, he chided them into um, thinking in, in, in whole terms and, and, and using all of that knowledge together and where they didn't have it at that point when they needed it. You constantly saw them running to the books to gain new knowledge to deal with that situation. So that's, let's say, um, uh, on the one hand, why it was so great. And on the other hand, because it showed the difference in how a, an expert solves a problem and a novice solves the problem. Uh, the novice, his students, made use of means-ends analyses, a, a very weak problem-solving method, in which they said, first, we have to try this, we have to try this, whereas he immediately came with two diagnoses and went backwards and said, and what do we need to see whether or not it's this or that? Um, medical schools, law schools, those professions, they have, after gaining your initial knowledge, have an incredible trajectory of, of um, uh, kind of like the, the guild system of being from a, a, a learner to a journeyman to being an expert in which they do it. You don't immediately go from law school to pleading a case. You go to work at a law firm and you start there in helping someone else who's going to plead the case do the research that's necessary. You go with that person. You, you, you do mock trials. You do all of those types of things in order to put it all together. And those are two professions in which the um, professional group has realized that when you're done with your education at the bachelor or master level, you're nowhere near being um, start the crime, um, uh, being able yeah, to yeah, like competent, like you're, like yeah, you're yeah, not a, yeah. you're not you're you're not even a competent beginner. So does that mean then that uh, the first two years of medical school or law school could be made more efficient by integrating that practice? Well, yeah, th there are certain there are certain ones that do that. Um, although it's not my favorite way of dealing with it at the University of Maastricht at McMaster in uh, in in Canada, what they do is they work on a problem or a project based curriculum, in which um, they have they have what's called a cumulative exam at the end of each year. But at the end of the first year, you're only expected to know like one quarter of what's in that if it's a four year thing. And that's not a problem because everything will be handled within all of the different cases and situations by the end of that five year medical study. And you're it's, it's, it's not like you have to know at the end of this moment of time, all of pathology or all of anatomy or all of whatever. You learn that which you need for anatomy within the task that you're doing at that moment. And so at the end of that time, you've already done it in very, very many different situations. You've made use of that anatomical or pathological or physiological knowledge that you, you, you've, you've gained. You've gained it in all different types of situations. You've gained things about the, 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 the physiology of the lungs when you needed it. And you didn't get anything about the physiology of your toes at that moment. Well, I'm going to interrupt you because it's 55 and Julia's okay. had her hand up for a while. So I want okay. to give her the last opportunity to ask her question in the last couple of minutes that we have okay. left. Yeah, so thanks. My question is around the constituent skills, Paul. I really liked your analogy with the bike. Yeah. But my question is, what happens when those constituent skills in and of themselves are really complicated or complex? So like you have a super complex thing that you're trying to learn, and then the constituent skills themselves are also pretty complicated and complex and actually stand alone. Um, on their, they can also stand alone, but they're oh, yeah. part of the larger, the larger thing. So, how would you think about that? 
But it depends upon how you want to deal with the situation. If you see it as something that is standalone, yeah, that in itself, being able to do that is a task that you consider worthy, yeah, then maybe you should then not deal with the head task, yeah, but deal with the constituents so as long as you do in the same way as a task, so that that whole thing is rounded, so long as it doesn't end up being part task skills, you know, like um, uh, rolling a joint or uh, uh, a, uh, uh, you know, like th those types of things. Those are, are not constituent skills, those are past part, part task skills. But if the, I mean, if you bring the whole task down to its lowest level of simplicity least let's call it least complex then i expect that constituent skill also to be there but mm -hmm. i also consider that constituent skill to be less complex than it would be if you were dealing with another situation yeah so my first thing would say bring it down and see what of that constituent skill do you need to solve that least complex task whole task and if you can't do that yeah then you have to consider the constituent constituent skill itself to be the whole task and maybe have to deal with that separately but hopefully in the context of where will you eventually need it and it might be a constituent skill that you need in seven different situations mm -hmm. okay yeah. It is now thank 50. you. So it's 58 now. So, Paul, I'm going to put you on the spot and um, ask you for a closing statement, maybe some encouraging words. I don't know for us. Um, who, uh, yeah, try encouraging to words. Um, uh, when you when when you go into a uh, um, a client uh, relationship, expect the worst and hope for the best. Yeah, uh, that's my first. Uh, realize in your what you're doing um, what the main goal is and what your small change is. That's often what I notice even with people when they're going into having their uh, evaluation meetings with their bosses and things like that. I want this, I want that, I want that to come out of it. And I always say to them, um, what do you actually want to walk away with and what's your, what's your small change that you're willing to to um, sacrifice to achieve your your, your ultimate goal. Um, those are the types of things that I would say seeing your situations because you constantly have to deal with someone else. Yeah? So um, uh, that, would, that, that would be it. And finally, before you start, analyze. Analyze, analyze, analyze. If you take the time to analyze, you'll save time in the eventual project and construction. If you don't take that time, you'll end up spending more time developing and designing things that eventually probably don't work or are not scalable. Okay? Okay, thank you, Paul. I know you need to drop. Thank you so much no. for coming. Bye-bye, everyone. You can always email you. Matt and uh, Miriam can tell you how. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Thanks. Sorry, this is a bit of a sudden stop, uh, but we, we knew that this was going to happen. And I think it's also good that we not keep that we don't keep going over as, as we usually do. Um, so please reach out on Bleakit if you have more questions or if you have more thoughts. Andrew, I've seen that you already have I put some stuff on there. Uh, so I really hope that we can still spend some time in Blinket together and then um, hopefully wrap it up. We by also the end of this week. we had an inquiry uh, to set up a an additional live session that's a, a little more Aussie friendly uh, to do a general discussion. I uh, will moderate that. Miriam will talk if you're able to make it. Great. If not, okay. I'll take care of it. And the request actually was to enable folks to finish the conference and actually schedule it post-conference, so not this week. 
So we will make that happen. Um, uh, we just wanted to make sure the people who requested it, we wanted to make sure could make it. Uh, Crocker, you're one of them. Uh, so we want to make sure you're able to make it. Um, and, um, and so that'll be just an informal follow-up discussion on everything you've done and, um, and be able to answer any final questions and we'll, we'll anti zagarnik it and, uh, um, have some closure. So okay. sound good. Hey, I hope this was useful for, uh, for people. Um, and, sure. uh, yeah. Let's talk again soon. Um, good luck this week, and there will be a touch. Take care, everyone. I'll stop the recording. Yeah.